Please welcome Joseph Fink. So, speaking of presenter's notes, I literally learned how they worked this morning, so that'll be a real treat for all of us. Um, I don't have the kind of talk that uh, I really needed slides to illustrate, but this big screen seemed really, uh, well, it seemed tempting. So what I did is I took a random selection of photos I had taken on my phone in the last year, and I put them in a completely random order, and occasionally I'm just gonna press this button, and I hope it will be helpful for all of us. So, um, I wanna talk today about uh, sudden success, and that's a tricky thing to claim authority on. The definition is helplessly relative and blurry, and, and anyone claiming expertise risks looking absurd. So I just want to start by saying that I don't know what sudden success means in some larger universal sense. I just know what happened to me. And what happened to me is this. Uh, my friends and I made a podcast, and we still do. And that's pretty much the story I, I have about... <laughs> Listen, I have about 20 minutes to fill out here, so I'm going to give you the longer version. The longer version is that in July of last year, July of 2013, I was doing a job, and that job was I stood at a table on the street in New York City, and I tried to convince people to switch their electric bills over to a large wind and water energy provider based in Texas. Uh, for five hours at a time, I would stand at that table uh, in swamp humidity and in snowdrifts and very rarely in good weather, and I would talk to every single person that walked by, and that is an excellent lesson in empathy and the complete lack of it that the world has for you. And I was only paid per completed sign-up, so I actually would often work for hours and just make nothing. Um, and I, I had been doing that job at that time for about a year and a half, and it was while doing that job that I started this project. And as Andy said, that project is, is a podcast. Uh, it's a podcast that is a scripted fictional podcast that takes the form of community radio from a small desert town where things like ghosts and angels and aliens are just day-to-day -day parts of life. I called it Welcome to Night Vale. My friend Jeffrey and I write the scripts, and our friend Cecil read the words. We record it on a $60 USB microphone, and we edit it on Audacity, free audio editing software. That's how we've done it from the beginning till now. Um, the first year we were doing it, there were some really exciting moments for us. Uh, we, were, we were mentioned on a podcast we liked. Uh, a musician whose music I liked said he listened to it. Um, but really the most important thing for us is that it became apparent there was a few people we did not personally know who were downloading this. And honestly, like, the story could end there, and it would be artistically one of the most exciting things that has ever happened in my life. In um, June of... It's a, a caterpillar I found in Hudson, New York. Uh, in uh, in uh, June of 2013, we did our one-year anniversary party at a bar space in the East Village that we got for free through a guy who liked the show. There were 115 people there, and we did a little like test live show, it was our first attempt at one, and it felt really good. And then I, I went home that night, and I slipped on my stairs and bruised my tailbone, and I had a voicemail from my boss yelling at me about something I had screwed up that day at work, uh, which was also, by the way, one of those days in which I had made absolutely nothing. Now, that June, our one year mark, we had 150,000 downloads total for that year. And throughout the year, we had talked about where we might be download-wise at the one-year mark, and the highest guess we had was 50,000 less than that. So we were really happy about that. Now, what was also happening that June, although we did not know it at the time, is that people on Tumblr were starting to talk about our show. And the next month, in July of 2013, and just in that month, we had 2.5 million downloads. And the next month, that August, and just in that August, we more than tripled that number. I got uh, my first TV offer while I was standing 
at that table on the street trying to get people to switch to green energy. Uh, this, someone who was walking by had just told me to fuck off. Or I don't actually know if that's true. Uh, the whole entire year and a half of doing that just kind of blends into this single moment of standing and discomfort and the reactions of New Yorkers when you approach them on the street. But it could well have happened. It happened a lot. And then I looked down at my phone and I had um, an email from an agent saying their client was a TV producer who wanted to buy the rights to Welcome to Night Vale. And I, I put my phone away and I did the rest of my shift and I, I made money or I didn't. I honestly don't remember. And a few days later, I quit my job and I really, really hoped I would make enough to make rent. Our first real live show, well, that's a picture of the table where I sold green energy. Um, our first real live show was at a bookstore uh, in the hate called The Booksmith. This was the first one we did with a, yeah, it's a cool place. Um, it's the first one we did with a paying crowd and a script written specifically to be performed live. Uh, we sold out our first 300 capacity show and we added a second one and that one sold out too. And I, I, I remember a few days before the show, I wrote the script for it and I sent it to Jeffrey, my co-writer, with the note, I, I don't know, I, I don't hate it. I mean, I was just so defeated by the idea of living up to this idea of a fan base that had just appeared and that we did not even understand yet. But I also knew that at a certain point you just have to let go and just kind of put what you've made out into the world in whatever state it is and let it live or die on its own terms. And so we did the show. Um, I ran the sound from my laptop in the young adult section. And I sat there and I watched people react to the script I had just written. And people were leaning forward, people were laughing. Uh, this teenage girl in the front row covered her mouth and she cried. And I've, I've had a lot of amazing moments since then and I hope there's more to come, but I don't think I will ever top that first time we performed Night Vale in front of a live crowd and I saw what it meant to people. And I realized that what it meant to people was beyond us, that we were probably irrelevant to their experience of something much bigger than us that they just happened to be connecting to in that moment through some words we were writing. That was um, September of last year, it was almost exactly one year ago. And since then we have performed in over 40 cities. We've done the live show over 70 times. Most of those have sold out. Our second year anniversary party, one year after the 115 people in that bar space in the East Village, was in a sold out Broadway theater to over 2,000 people. Um, thank you. Uh, we have a, a, a book coming out next year. Look, what I'm saying is, I went from a bad job to a good job. <laughs> and, and I'm happy about it. <laughs> Thank you. And so this is all to say that this is what I mean by sudden success. Um, but success is not without complication. And that complication is manifold and all mixed in with everything that makes it good, and it's, it's, it's complicated. But in the interest of saying words to you at this moment, I, I've, I have a few. Um, the first is that success turned my friends into my coworkers. I mean, these people that I did a hobby with, and it was always only meant to be a hobby, I suddenly was running a business with. And our conversations were not just about what joke to put into the next episode, but, ab but about accountants and royalties and venue rentals. I've spent countless hours in a minivan with these people this year. I've sat down to eat dinner with them night after night. I've shared a beer with them at two in the morning on a weekday in the Hampton Inn in Boise. And the Hampton Inn in Boise is, scientifically speaking, the most depressing place in the entire world. <laughs> the, the relationship I had with these people before is gone. It has to be because it was based on a reality that doesn't exist anymore. And the, the relationship that replaced it is probably better, but it is definitely different. Um, and it's not just the context of business that is lying over these relationships, but also higher stakes. Uh, we have casual conversations over beer that turn into legal contracts and months of our lives. Um, and not, not to mention that there are now thousands and thousands of people who actually care about what we decide to do. It's 
genuinely terrifying. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't give this up for anything, but I also lie awake at night in my bed and I look at a clock that says a number I could count on one hand, and I feel a vibrating wire of tension in my chest, and I wonder just how much stress it takes to cause a heart attack. D don't worry about it. Look, here's a picture of a baby. <laughs> it's my nephew. Um, so those are some complications. And then there's kind of the ultimate good thing and complication, which is fans. I mean, when a lot of people started listening to our show, what that ultimately meant is that there were a lot of people listening to our show. And all of those people had their own opinions and uh, feelings and stakes in what we were doing. Um, my co-writer Jeffrey has this idea that if you show people a selection of random photos while talking to them, the audience will always find a way to connect what you are saying to the random photos you are showing. We don't like things that don't match, and we're very good at making connections. So let's say this next photo, which was genuinely just whatever photo came up next, represents the complicated relationship with a group of strangers who only know you through the work you do. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> I want to preface this next part by saying that by being white and male, Jeffrey Cecil and I have avoided most of the truly terrifying and grotesque side effects that can come from having an audience. And in this way, and in so many ways, we are lucky and we are privileged. And, and there are a lot of joys that come from this. There are emails from people with severe anxiety or depression, or just the feeling of being the only person like them who lives in the place they do, who tell us that in some way, in whatever way, our work helped them. There was, um, there was a woman in the Philippines who said that listening to our show kept her calm through the typhoon. And there's lots of people who we didn't help in some larger way, but who just liked what we do and told us so. And that, what an amazing thing to do to another human being, to say, hey, I, I like what you do. But, I mean, there's other things. Uh, Cecil on the street in San Diego, a woman ran up and, and tackled him from behind and told him she couldn't wait to watch his show. Uh, in Canada, when we went out, at, at a, not just in general in Canada, at one show in Canada, <laughs> we went out to sign after a show, and a man in a mask ran at Cecil with his arm raised in what was, to the man, a hilarious reference to our show, but what was to Cecil, a man in a mask running at him silently with his arm raised. <laughs> um, the man said to Jeffrey later, Cecil didn't seem to want the sticker I was trying to give him. <laughs> uh, a, a fan in Salt Lake City that I was talking to suddenly shouted in my face about how she wanted a plot line to turn out and then followed that up with, but I don't want to tell you what to write. But of course she did want to tell me what to write. She, I mean, they all kind of do and they all kind of don't, and I know that feeling exactly because I've been a fan myself. Um, on the website, an archive of our own, and just on that website, I looked this up just before coming here, there are almost 4,000 works of Night Vale fan fiction, and I have read absolutely none of them, and I never will. <laughs> but, but I'm really glad they're there. It's just... They are creativity that belong to the, belongs to the fans that are making them, and I don't want that mixed in with my own thoughts and my own writing process, and I don't want to be put into the position of judging how these people experience my work. Um, I'm a little more open to fan art just because what we do does not have a visual component. In Welcome to Night Vale, we do not physically describe characters, except as is absolutely necessary to the plot or the occasional extraneous and intentionally unhelpful description designed to obfuscate the issue. Um, but still, despite that, we regularly get asked, what do the characters really look like? As though this talk of visuals not mattering were a cover story for the secret detailed descriptions we have locked away somewhere. It's actually one of the most common questions we get. Uh, at a Q&A in Seattle, a fan waited patiently through this thing I just said about visuals not mattering to us, and she said, no, I, I understand that, but can you just tell me, what is the pattern on Carlos's apron? And she seemed genuinely angry when I told her I, I could not tell her. Our, our fan base um, is on Tumblr, and that is an overwhelmingly visual fan base. 
And, and we think that's actually what is one of the things that drew people to the show in the first place. Their visual art did not have to look like any specific actor or character. They could imagine these characters however they wanted. Um, and this has led to a, a tremendous amount of discussion and disagreement about what these characters look like. A lot of it focusing on the very legitimate concern of people's tendency or, uh, yeah, people's tendency to default to a white depiction of characters whose race is never described. Um, and these disagreements are what lead them back to us because there is this belief or I, I think just this feeling there, that there has to be an objective answer somewhere. And the only place it could possibly exist is in the heads of the guys who write the show, but it's not, it's not there. And it's really hard to ask a question and then be told that the answer just doesn't exist. These, these disagreements are ones that we can't join in or be involved in. They don't belong to us. Like all fan discussion or like all fan culture, they belong only to the fans. And Honestly, I think that's the only way to handle. Did that ever get built? This was from, this was from January I was here and took that picture. Let me know if the dog gym ever happened. Um, it's kind of, it was like a little north of Powell's, somewhere in that area. Uh, this is, I think, the only way to handle the idea of a fandom around something that you make. You have to realize that it's not about you and that while the work itself belongs to you, the fandom does not, even though the fans themselves often won't understand this, even though we get emails asking us to referee on minor fandom disagreements and online feuds, we, we let the fans build what they like, and we do the show the way we've always enjoyed doing it. We tell the stories that seem interesting to us, and we make the jokes that make us laugh. And there is always this clawing fear, of course, that our interests and the interests of these people that we don't know that perhaps didn't even seem real to us until they were standing in front of us in the hundreds and the thousands, that those two interests that for an unlikely moment converged will once again go their separate ways and our audience will lose interest in what we do. And, and maybe that will happen. Maybe the plane I'm taking home tonight will crash. Maybe anything. You can't base your life around the worst case. To go back a bit to that version of myself a year ago, uh, working a job based on the hospitality of New Yorkers who have somewhere to be, uh, <laughs> there was this kind of amazing lag between the fandom appearing and it changing my life at all. We had fans on Tumblr talking about us as though we had the clout of Vince Gilligan or Damon Lindelof, but I was living in a 500 square foot apartment and I was barely over the poverty line. I was not Vince Gilligan and so, so many ways, <laughs> but that's, uh, that's about seven feet wide in real life, by the way. Um, but this woman emailed us about something in the show very early on, and I emailed her back, and she posted my response on Tumblr without ever replying to me directly. And I asked her why she did this, and she told me that as a public figure, it's assumed that anything I write is for public consumption. But but I didn't know I was a public figure. I thought I was a guy making less than minimum wage and helping my friends make no budget experimental theater in the evenings. Um, and I still don't think I'm a public figure, but I am a lot more careful now. And, and that's, that's kind of the thing, is that success, as likely, unlikely as it ever is, can only come if you throw yourself into the world recklessly, if you actually make the things you think idly of making and then try and get people to look at them, even though a lot of those people won't like that thing and they will tell you so. But then when success comes, it draws you back into yourself. The higher stakes makes the possibility of failure, which before was just your status quo, seem like this chasm you'd never climb out of. And so success, comes from fearlessness, but it leads to caution, and what's the solution to that? I, I, I don't know. I mean, when I, when I talked to Andy about what this talk should be, I asked him if it should be about an idea or about a story, and he told me to tell a story, and that's good, because I don't, I don't know what idea to take from this year I've had. I don't know how to sum it up, and I don't know what there is to learn from it. I've been showing you these photos in this way because this is how I experienced this year. 
So many things happened to me, the nature and quantity of which seemed entirely unlikely, and so to me it became just this jagged line of disconnected moments, zigzagging through my memory in a way that I could not possibly follow with any linear logic. I mean, success, as I've experienced it, is confusing and scary and exhilarating, and it's the best thing that's ever happened to me, and I wake up every single day tired and stressed, and all of those things are true all at once. I think that the success of Night Vale was only good for us because Night Vale was something we had enjoyed doing it, doing, and we were doing it with people we enjoyed working with. And so the success has just meant that we got to work with those people more and do that thing we enjoyed doing every single day. And if we had been doing something we hated just to become successful, then the best case scenario we would have had was to have to do that thing a lot. And if we had been working with people we hated, the best thing we could hope for was to have to see those people all the time that we didn't like in the first place. And anyway, success is this weird intersection of privilege. <laughs> she looks a little different now. Um, <laughs> success is this weird intersection of privilege and luck, and it's almost entirely out of your control. So, I guess just this. Make things you like, make them with people you like, treat those people with respect, and if you make any money at all, if you're lucky enough to do that, pay those people you're working with. Every time, no excuses. And that's, that's the best you can do, that's the best any of us can do, and then we just do what we all do, Every single day, we brace ourselves and we wait to see what the world will do to us next. Thank you. <laughs>